Hello, this is Kyle, also known as AlienTube, and today I have part one of a review of Balor Arms' 15th century German longsword. Now I say part one because I'm still unable to do any cutting, but with how excellently my Balor Arms 15th century Italian longsword is for that, I don't think a review of this German one will be complete without test cutting, so I'm going to break it into two parts. Hopefully my elbow will heal soon and I can give you my thoughts on how the sword performs. This is a new model from Balor Arms, released a few months ago. It, along with several other new models, was initially supposed to be available near the beginning of the year, but that was delayed due to shipping backlogs and the mess that is shipping containers in the COVID era. Like everything from Balor Arms, this sword is available exclusively through Cult of Athena, although the owner of the forge that contracts to make them seems to be offering some of their models on Facebook. In any case, I purchased the sword from KOA in August of this year and paid them to sharpen it as well as dye the rain flaps brown. The total price including those services was $294.95 US. Without either, the sword retails for approximately $250, although it is currently out of stock. When I bought the sword with the sharpening and dyeing, the website said it would add 16 days to the handling time. Due to the backlog Cult of Athena has been dealing with, it ended up taking a full month to ship. When I received it, I was underwhelmed by the packaging, a first for Cult of Athena. The sword was wrapped thoroughly and secured well, but the scabbard was just tossed into the box loose, almost like an afterthought. I'm not sure why it wasn't shipped in the scabbard, but if they're going to separate them in the box, the scabbard should be wrapped up in their traditional brown paper as well. Disappointment with Cult of Athena is, unfortunately, going to be something of a recurring theme in this review. But let's put that aside and take a look at the sword. It's not exactly representative of any specific oakshot type, being kind of a blend between a 16A and 18A. The fuller and profile are typical of a 16A, but the flattened diamond cross section is more like that of a 18A. Cult of Athena's description calls it a 16A, and overall I do agree with that assessment. 16A longswords are intended to be good at both cutting and thrusting, and they saw the most use during the early 14th century. Now as a quick disclaimer, please keep in mind that everything in this review is my opinion about this specific sword only. Other examples of this model could be different, and I have no way of knowing. The first thing I want to talk about with this sword is some negatives. It's got some blemishes and a spot of rust on the blade that looks like it's the result of a fingerprint. Remember when I said disappointment with Cult of Athena was going to be a recurring theme? Now, supposedly they inspect each piece before shipping it out, but they completely missed these spots. They look pretty superficial and will probably be very easy to clean up, but I shouldn't have to do that with the new sword. Cult of Athena should have caught these issues. It's not really acceptable to sell a new sword at full price when it has multiple spots of rust. They claim one of the reasons they're backlogged is their quality inspections, but when I emailed them about this, they use the excuse of the backlog to say that's why they were missed. In any case, the spots aren't going to ruin the sword, so let's take a look at it starting with the hilt. The pommel is a classic type I wheel pommel, one of the most common styles found on swords throughout the medieval period. It's very well formed, and the corners are chamfered nicely, keeping it from biting into the hand. Unfortunately, there are several spots of that aforementioned rust on here, including what again looks like a fingerprint. It's peened to the tang, and the peen is smoothed over very nicely. It's not very noticeable at all unless you're looking specifically for it. It's also attached very securely. I twisted the pommel and hit it several times when looking at the vibrations of the blade, and it hasn't budged at all. I'm very pleased with the execution here. The same goes for the grip. It's a wood core, bound in leather with a cord imprint, and it has several risers underneath the leather. The central riser is extremely prominent, which helps guide the hands on where to grip. The seam in the leather is straight, not noticeable by feel, and clean. With the nicely done elliptical shape, indexing the sword is easy. I can definitely say I'm a fan of this grip. There's rain flaps that sit between the cross guard and grip. These rain flaps, guards, whatever you want to call them, are not uncommon on later period medieval swords. I wasn't sure if I would like them when I ordered the sword, but upon handling it, I actually really appreciate them. A lot of positions in my HEMA school call for thumbing the blade, and the rain flaps are perfectly situated so that my thumb doesn't actually touch the blade. That's great because there's less skin oils getting on the steel, so less chance of corrosion. Plus, it just feels nice. The rain flaps are, by default, undyed leather. 
Cultivathena offers to dye them for an additional 25 US dollars. I chose to add this service and selected brown as the dye color based mostly off the pictures from their website. Unfortunately, the dye job I got is, in my opinion, considerably worse than their example. There's a lot less depth to the color, and it's just a dark brown that's not particularly attractive. I think I would have preferred the undyed look. Under those rain flaps, the cross guard looks like a Type 6 to me. It has something akin to trifoil cutouts near the ends of the quill ends that provide a spot of decoration. There's not a ton of depth to this cross guard. It tapers in thickness very slightly from the center to the tips of the quill ends, but that's about it. The dye from the rain flaps has spilled onto the cross guard, and there's also a few small spots of visible rust here. The gap where the cross guard meets the blade is about what I'd expect for this price range. It's not egregiously large, nor does it look like it's designed for a different sword entirely. I don't see any gunk or epoxy peeking out, which is a good thing. Moving on to the scabbard for a moment, this is pretty bare bones. It's wood core and wrapped in fairly cheap feeling leather. It has a couple of risers that act as locations to add your own suspension system, as well as a shiny shape that kind of clashes with the finish of the rest of the sword. The shape does react to a magnet, so it's probably some variety of mild or stainless steel. The fit of the sword to the scabbard is decent. There's very little rattle, but pretty much no retention. The sword slides out very easily. I personally prefer a snugger fit than this, but it's fine in a budget sword. Now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. First off, here's the measurements I took of it, compared with Cult of Athena's listed stats. Overall, everything is pretty close to the specifications, with the biggest deviation being in the distal taper, where my sword is thinner at the cross guard and thicker near the tip. Let's talk about that distal taper. Frankly, there's just not much of it. Going from 4.1mm to 3mm, with the majority of the blade at 4.1mm, is not what I would consider well-defined distal taper. Let's compare it to another Type 16A sword I own, one made by Tom Kinder. As you can see, the Tomkin sword starts thicker and has an evenly distributed distal taper, ending in a considerably thinner point. Now I don't have extensive experience with Type 16A swords, so I don't know which of these geometries is more common to them, but I do know that I prefer the Tomkin style. It leads to a sword that has excellent handling and harmonics. Since distal taper and the cross section of the blade play such a huge part in the flexibility of a sword, let's look at that now. This one's center of percussion is around what I'd call three-fifths of the way up the blade. It flexes and returns to true nicely. One note about this before I move on. About half the time when I struck the pummel, the sword made a very odd sound that I can best describe as warping. I wasn't able to capture the sound in recording as it was pretty subtle. I'm not sure what to make of it because I haven't heard a sword make this sound before. Moving on to the finish of the sword. It's a rough satin with a good number of grind lines. I don't mind the look, but I'm sure it would drive some people crazy. What does bother me is the rust spots that I already pointed out. Also, the maker's mark is considerably cruder than the one on my 15th century Italian longsword. Take a look at the difference here. Looking down the length of the blade, there's a lot of rippling on the surface, which I was completely expecting due to my experience with other Balor arm swords. The fuller terminations are decent, but they don't end at the exact same spot on the sword on both sides. The tip is well formed, tapering into a mostly acute point. The sharpening here is even and well done, something I can't say about the rest of the sword. It's unevenly sharp, and the bevels are wildly inconsistent. It was really hard to capture this, but all four bevels have different angles to them, leading to an edge that both looks inexpertly done and will probably produce inconsistent results. I know when I tried test cutting paper with it, every cut was an adventure. I never knew if it was going to slice right through the paper cleanly or tear it. It's the worst example of Cult of Athena's sharpening service I've experienced. Lastly, let's talk about the blade's handling. It's balanced at 4.5 inches, which I find to be a very good point, leading to a sword that feels light enough to be agile, while still having some forward weight to lend authority to the cut. I put it through a few guard positions, and it felt good doing them. Please don't be too harsh on my form in these. I'm a novice, and my elbow is both injured and restricted by a compression sleeve. Still, it felt good to handle the sword, and as I mentioned earlier, I really like the way the rain flaps protect the sword when thumbing it. 
Now I don't feel confident talking about bottom line yet, since this is only part one of the review. When I buy a budget sword, I do so with the expectation that I'll be doing a good amount of cutting with it, so giving a verdict without doing that testing would feel incomplete. What I will say is that this seems like a good quality sword that could probably use some refinement, especially in the distal taper. And obviously, I wish Cult of Athena had exercised more attention to quality control here. I hope this initial review has been helpful to you, and hopefully I'll be able to cut with the sword soon and give you my final thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel. Until next time, Alien Dude out.